Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. The human experience is traveling like a vortex up through your spine into your cerebral cortex as we speak to my guest, Dr. Marco Iacoboni. Marco, it's a pleasure, sir. Welcome to HXP. Uh, Pleasure to be here. So, Marco, I, I really like your bio on your website. It reads, quote, To be honest, I really don't give a damn about the brain. I care about the human soul. However, I believe, happen to believe that the soul is in the mind and the mind is a functional process instantiated by the brain with its interactions with the body and the environment. How interesting. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I must say that when we revamped the website for the lab and I asked every one of my trainees to write a little blurb on themselves and then we had a kind of a dry run looking at the website and they looked at my own yeah, one of my trainees said, are you sure you want to put that thing on, on the website? Uh, and the idea is that, you know, if you're a neuroscientist, you should really care about the brain. But the point I was trying to make in a kind of a jokingly fashion is that, uh, yeah, we study the brain, but why do we study the brain? Not because of the brain itself, but because the brain is an important organ that really guides our lives. Um, and the other thing I wanted to you know, to say in a very concise way is that even though it's an important organ that guides our life and determines how we behave, it's not just the brain. The brain, it's an organ in the body and the body, it's really embedded and situated in the world. And so we have to consider all these interactions, even when we just study the brain. That was the point of the blurb. (laughs) Right. Uh, So, I mean, you are most widely known for your work on uh, mirror neurons, social cognition, and I know that you like to kind of talk about this. How were mirror n- neurons discovered? What Walk us yeah. through that process. So there were these scientists that uh, incidentally were in, in Italy. I'm Italian, and though I've been living in Los Angeles for almost a quarter of a century now. And they were studying uh, a system in the brain of the monkey that controls grasping. Grasping is in a sense, we don't even, we don't give it a second thought, but we grasp things all the time. If we are not able to grasp, our life is really severely impaired. And so they were studying how the brain controls grasping because it's an important way to figure out how to help patients that have grasping deficits after, say, a brain damage, after like a stroke. Um, but one thing that they found, and they were really surprised, and they were so surprised that initially they wouldn't believe themselves that they actually had found this thing. And they did a lot of control experiments to really make sure that this was a real phenomenon. They found that some of these cells that really send the signals from the brain of the monkey to the muscle of the hand of the monkey so that the monkey can grasp like a piece of ra- raisin and put it in their mouth, a banana or something like that, they found that some of these cells also fire when the monkey is not moving at all. It's just watching someone else making those grasping actions. And again, again, this was something that if you had asked a neuroscientist 25 years ago, is there something in the brain like that? They would have said, are you nuts? It's impossible. Um, So there was really an initial disbelief. But then the idea was that, well, when the phenomenon was really established as a real phenomenon. The question was, why do we have this stuff in the brain? What is the adaptive advantage of having mirror neurons in the brain? And so one of the hypotheses was that, well, maybe these cells are really important for making us understand what's going on in the minds of other people without really having making too much effort. So if I look at you grasping a cup of coffee and the neurons in my brain, that fire up whenever I grasp something, also fire up by just watching you grasping a cup of coffee. I don't really have to, you know, think very hard what you're doing. I'm basically activating in my own brain the same neurons that they activate when I actually am grasping a cup of coffee. 
And that means that we have this immediate connection and immediate understanding of the mental states and of the actions of other people. Hmm. Very interesting. So do, do all mammals have these mirror neurons or is it just monkeys and humans? Good question. Um, the cells were discovered in the monkey brain. Now we know we have also the same cells in the human brain. We know for sure that songbirds, those little cute birds that uh, sing songs, learn how to sing songs through some sort of mirror neurons. These are neurons in the brain of the songbird that fire when the bird is singing, but also when the bird is listening to the song that he will eventually sing. It is possible that there are mirror neurons in many other species. One of the ideas that we have is that, in principle, it could be a fairly simple mechanism to associate your motor plans, what you plan to do with your body, with the sight of someone else doing the same thing. But there is no direct evidence that there are mirror neurons in other species, at least not so, uh, not yet. And uh, because the way neuroscience is done, um, we tend to study only certain species with certain techniques. So I don't really see that we will discover mirror cells in other animals anytime soon, but mostly because people are not really looking. Um, And I would say that if I had to bet money, I would say most likely some kind of mirroring happens in many species in many brains. Very interesting. So how does how does the evolution and the growth inside the brain happen when, like, say, for example, when a child is learning, uh, looking in a mirror and realizing that it's it's their own face that they're seeing? How does that growth happen? And, and what can we learn from from this? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and I, I must say, we don't have an answer because we don't have hard data on this, but we have certainly some speculations that we can make. Uh, you made a good point. And, and children, even when they're in the first year of life, can look into the mirror, at the, their own face reflected by a mirror. It turns out that they're not even aware that it's their own face. You can make some tests to demonstrate that, but they like to do that. I think that mirror neurons really get created, so to speak, by the interactions between the baby and the caregiver. So what happens is that, suppose I'm the baby and you're the caregiver. Humans, what they tend to do is adults. They tend to actually imitate what the baby does. So if I'm the baby and I'm smiling, the caregiver tends to smile back at the baby. Um, We like that. We kind of like to, to join in. And what happens in the baby's brain, the baby's brain can simply associate. It's called associative learning. It's a fairly simple way in which brains learn how to do things. Um, The brain of the baby can associate the motor plan for, say, making a smiling face with the sight of someone else making a smiling face. And by doing that, you create a mirror neuron for smiling. That's the way I think, actually, mirror neurons are are actually created. We know that there are probably, I mean, we know, we speculate that there are probably mirror neurons at birth in just in an infant brain. And that's because even if, if you just look, at infants, really young infants, this is the work that Andy Meltzoff has done some years ago, you can show that infants that were just born a few minutes ago, they can imitate some rudimentary facial gestures, like, you know, sticking your tongue out or protruding your lips. And that suggests that maybe there are some mirroring cells already at birth. But we think that a lot of mirroring cells in the brain of the baby actually get uh, developed and uh, uh, are in a way become stronger and more represented in the baby baby's brain by just these uh, interactions with the caregiver. You talk about, in your research, you talk about social interactions and how people might use these neurons to establish a higher social status. And I mean, what has your research so- shown about like the the biomarker of of social uh, cognition and how does this work in regards to how we relate with other people good question um we think that one thing the mirroring does is to create this I- immediate connection it's a sort of we call it pre-reflective because again you don't have to think about it and this connection is really the basis of what we call empathy which is a fundamental um, aspect of uh, social behavior. You need to empathize with other people in order to um, create a society. 
On the other hand, it's also true that empathy is strongly linked to another thing that we think mirror neurons do, which is imitation. Through imitation, we learn how to do things. If we are in a social, um, fairly novel context, uh, we look at other people behave and we tend to, we tend to uh, blend in to do what they do. It turns out that imitation is a fundamental aspect of human behavior, and uh, indeed it's important for learning, but also it's important for transmission of culture. It also shows that uh, imitative behavior in humans, that humans tend to imitate people of two kinds, either people that are like them or people that have a, a social status, that they have power, uh, influence, uh, they are well respected. Um, so... What it tells us is that there is a really a strong link between the tendency to empathize and the tendency to actually conform and the tendency to also understand how social hierarchies work. That tells us that this mirroring phenomenon is really embedded as a cornerstone of our ability to be social animals, to really um, have mental states and thoughts and feelings about other people. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of your one of another another one of your quotes that I really like is uh, while we interact with other people, we find ourselves. So it's uh, how does this process happening in the brain itself? I mean, how have you guys tested this? Well, that's that's another good, good question. So if you look, for instance, in uh, again, we can go back to early in life. I told you that. Babies in the first year of life, they are delighted to play um, in front of a mirror and they see their own image and they smile and they do things. They have no clue that that's their own face. How do we know that? If the baby falls asleep, I can put a big red mark on his forehead. And when the baby wakes up and is in front of the mirror, he still plays but doesn't show any change in behavior. Now, if you do the same trick a year later when the baby is almost two years old, almost like a toddler, uh, then what happens is that the, 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 the toddler wakes up, looks at the mirror, and sees the big thing on his forehead. And then he starts scratching his forehead. So his behavior or her behavior really shows that the baby is actually aware that their face is her own or his own face. Okay, so that's called self-awareness. Now, look, let's look at another phenomenon. So we get a bunch of kids of, uh, you know, toward the second year of our life. Some of these have self-awareness. They pass the mirror test. They, they show that this, you know, behavior that they're really worried about what's going on on the forehead with that big red mark. Some others don't. So they show that they're not aware that the face that they see in front of a mirror is their own face. We put them in pairs, a pair of kids that are self-aware and a pair of kids that are not self-aware. What happens to their imitative behavior? What do they do? Spontaneously. You don't have to really tell them what to do. They're just playing. They're interacting. The kids that have self-awareness, they will be the ones that imitate the other more. The kids that have less self-awareness, they show much less imitation. What does it tell us? It tells us that whenever you acquire self-awareness, you also acquire awareness of the other. Uh, this is something that for the Western mind is very difficult to grasp because we are so entrenched into individualism. But for instance, in the Eastern philosophies, it's well understood that development of self is also development of the other. And I think mirroring really, mirroring in the brain really captures this very well. Wow, that's so profound. Yeah, that's very interesting. How fast do you think this, this, the growth of this research is occurring? How much new information are we discovering about, about the brain? Uh, well, it's going fast. I mean, we had really a beautiful 10 years run in which we did a lovely series of great experiments uh, in which we were addressing really the big question. And so is, are they important for imitation? Yes. Are they important for empathy? Yes. Uh, do they help us understand what's going on in the, in the minds of other people when they plan to do something? Yes. Um, can they teach us something about the fact that, for instance, uh, we tend to be more empathic for people that belong to our own social group? So I tend to empathize more, you know, let me give you a cartoonish example, more with another neuroscientist that would say, a golf player. Um, and that's also a phenomenon that's well established in human behavior, and it seems that mirroring is also relevant to that. So we have done all this, and now we're trying to address much more difficult questions. So for instance, uh, um, 
How can people tend to be more empathic than others? Or, or for instance, what is the role of mirroring in mental health or in mental health disorders? Um, do we actually use mirroring for uh, uh, recover from, say, um, brain damage? And if we have, say, a motor deficit, can we use mirroring um, to improve that? Those are more difficult questions. And so it's taking us a little longer to figure out exactly the answers. Um, uh, one thing that we know about neuroscience, though, is that there's plenty of uh, very good research and especially plenty of new tools that are coming along that will help us figure out these questions. What What are some of the roles that mirror neurons play in regards to substance abusers and people who relapse in addiction? Good questions, too. Um we had some behavioral data that suggested, actually, let me give you uh, background information. So, say you get uh, patients that have uh, alcohol abuse. Um, you put them through a rehab program. First of all, not a lot of patients actually succeed in coming out of their rehab program, program completely clean from the substance abuse. But some do. Uh, the problem is that these programs are very expensive, and if you look at the ones that are successfully out of the uh, alcohol abuse after, say, a rehab program, a year later, about two-thirds, two out of three of these guys actually are back into drinking. That's not a good stat, especially because these rehab programs are fairly expensive. Um, and we think that one of the reasons that they have this relapse is because of mirroring. I, mean, I call it, you know, jokingly the side, the dark side of mirroring. If I go out with you, supposing, you know, I, was, I had this drinking problem and then I'm clean, I went through rehab, I'm fine, and I'm going out with you socially, Seeing you drinking, even if though you know you're not really getting wasted, you're just having a glass of wine because you're having you know a night uh, out and talking to me about your life. Seeing you drinking becomes a powerful cue for me to go back to drinking. So with regard to that, one thing we are trying to do is to figure out can we actually suppress a little bit mirroring in these people. Uh, and that's the other complication that we are facing and we're trying to figure out how we can do control of mirroring. It's a very, I mean, we're actually working now, my lab is mostly focusing on that. How do you control mirroring? Because you, if you figure out how to control it, you can increase it or you can decrease it. That would be an important thing to do. And so we think that in substance abuse, certainly mirroring is this um, negative effect of uh, creating this tendency to relapse in people because they get these social cues. Hmm. Yeah, I find this all very intriguing. I mean, so th another aspect of your research uses uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and treating a variety of conditions. How does this treatment work and what makes it so useful? Uh, one of the things that's nice about transcranial magnetic stimulation, in other kinds of techniques that we call generally neuromodulation, non-invasive neuromodulation, but TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is probably the best is that uh, they are non-invasive, they have very little side effects, and they produce focal um, stimulation of brain regions. So I can stimulate one region of your brain, and the effects of the, my stimulation onto that region also spread throughout specific circuitry in your brain. So we can target circuits in the brain of people, and we can do that in a way that really doesn't induce any side effects. It's really nice because of these uh, properties. Um, we, it's already used fairly successfully in the treatment of depression, but we think that in principle can be used for a number of other conditions, and certainly it's also well used to study the brain. Because, for instance, the other thing we do is brain imaging, but with brain imaging, whenever I ask you to do something in the MR scanner and I see a brain region that lights up, I'm never sure that the region that lights up is actually causally related to your behavior. But if I use TMS, with TMS, I can actually stimulate that brain region. And if I induce a disruption in your behavior, I know that there is a causal relation between that brain region and your behavior. So these techniques are really very flexible, uh, they give us a lot of uh, ways of studying the brain, and they also give us the possibility of treating a number of um, neurological and psychiatric disorders without having the side effects of pharmacology. Has there has there been anything 
for you that you've found in your within your research that has been kind of a eureka moment or something mind blowing that that you can share with our audience? Uh, in my own research, while well, there's been a plenty of really exciting moments, for instance, uh, when we started doing the work on mirroring, we knew which brain regions were in the monkey brain that contained mirror neurons. And when I did my first imaging study on imitation, and I found that very similar regions were showing the pattern of activity that I thought would be the pattern of activity that the mirror neuron area would have, that was some sort of a eureka moment. Another one, when we actually applied this kind of research to patients with autism, our hypothesis was that, well, if these patients have difficulty in really relating socially with other people, perhaps it's because their mirroring capacity is reduced. And so if what mirroring does is really to create this very easy, effortless connection between people. If you don't have that, you can still interact with others, but it becomes much more, um, requires much more effort to really have an interaction with others. And to find that, in fact, those regions in these patients with autism that reduce mirroring, that was to me another eureka moment. Uh, so there, there have been a few. It's in, one thing I would say that when I started doing this work, initially I read the scientific report, and then I collaborated with the <coughs> with the scientists that did, made the discovery in the monkey brain. I must say that the papers weren't really, you know, too exciting. But then I visited the lab and I saw the monkeys and the recordings and you know the activity in these neurons. And that was another eureka moment. It was just wow! You can actually see the phenomenon as it unfolds uh, in front of you. So these are uh, a number of them. It's been uh, quite a lot of fun to be involved in this research. Yeah, you you touched a lot on empathy as well. Would you say that people such as sociopaths or people such as that, or psychiatric disorders, is this a, a problem for them? I mean, you having empathy because of the decreased mirror mirror neuron function. Yeah, we certainly think that there is a deficit in social cognition in in a lot of mental health disorders. Indeed, even in disorders in which uh, drugs can control the symptoms, let's take the example of schizophrenia. You may have a a patient with schizophrenia that has um, auditory hallucination. The patient hears voices inside his brain. You can control that with pills, okay, with drugs. Uh, yet, when the patient goes, goes back in the community, the functioning of these patients in the community is really not good. And the idea is that it's because they have an impairment in social cognition. Uh, and mirror neurons and mirroring and empathy are really cornerstone of social cognition. So we think that there is a, a, a widespread interest in mirroring and deficit in mirroring. And sometimes in, there may be even excess of mirroring in uh, a number of mental health disorders. Um, Certainly, empathy, again, it's by many people, many scholars and scientists, it's considered a cornerstone of social cognition. It doesn't explain all social cognition, but it's certainly you need to have empathy to be um, a fairly functioning social agent. And uh, lack of empathy or reduced empathy makes interactions much more difficult. Hmm. So, I mean, what is something that is, are there any exercises that we can do, like mental exercises that help us better imitate or better fit in socially? I would say yes. I mean, the first thing you want to do is to really just be so attuned to other people, to really pay attention to what they do. Um, some of these really will come naturally to people that are naturally empathic. I mean, if you're an empathic person, you tend to do this naturally. But if you're not, you can really, I wouldn't say force yourself, but you can make some little exercises in which whenever you're interacting with someone, you, you really try to be attuned to them. You can even try to, if it doesn't come naturally to you, it turns out most people do it naturally. I mean, if I, if we imitate our postures, we imitate our uh, hand gestures, it turns out we imitate even the words we use. If I use the word sofa in a conversation with you, you're going to probably use the word sofa uh, in a, later on if rather than using the word couch. Um, so you have a choice, but you kind of imitate me too, uh, even during conversation. 
We tend to do that naturally, but some people may have more difficulty in doing that. It turns out that if you try to, without being, you know, too overtly a parrot, because if you do that, then the other person would become, you know, will, 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 could get a little, you know, um, freaked out by what you're doing. But if you try to be attuned in a in a natural way, just try to follow the, the body language of the other person, I think that that's a nice way and fairly simple way to try to improve your capacity to empathize, to be really attuned to others. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. And your, your lab is also looking at the application of mirror neuron-led teaching ideas in the field of concept formation and imagination and, and role-playing in learning and the effect it has on, on sensor motor activity. What has been the result so far and and how can imaginative role immersion be something that we would use to to learn as a, as a learning tool? Yeah, that's actually unfortunately it's not a research is really doing uh, taking off a lot because I mean the research we do requires a lot of funding and we're not being successful in recruiting a lot of funding for this research but I think that's essential I think mean, one thing we're doing is that we're doing it all wrong when it comes to teaching and learning um, really learning in real life it's a multimodal experience what do I mean with that I mean I mean that I use my my vision I use my um, um, hearing, I use my sense of smell, I use the sense of the body. That's the way we learn how to do things. And it turns out when we when it comes to you know the classroom, we tend to have a much more impoverished way of teaching. There are the students sitting down and there is the teacher in front of them and the teacher just talks. Um, we think that it's much better to understand a concept if you actually use your imagination and you almost embody the concept you're trying to learn. And for instance, in a kind of a almost provocative slogan, we say, if you really want to understand the process of photosynthesis, I mean, eventually you're going to have to really learn the details of that it's been figured out by the scientists. But one way of doing that is whenever you're actually studying the, the whole process of photosynthesis, you may use your imagination and imagine that you're the plant themselves. And by doing that, your concepts are actually much more grounded into something that you understand in a very solid way. We have done some studies on college undergrads here at UCLA, and really we, we show that some subjects actually learn much faster with this way. It turns out that some others actually don't learn that fast, and that's the, the, the big um, obstacle we have to kind of face, to figure out which are the individual differences that make some people really thrive with this approach of, of teaching and learning, and some others don't. We think it's a matter of belief. That is, if I'm teaching my undergrads and I'm, t I'm telling them, I want you to use your body to mimic the concept you're studying, some of these kids will feel, wait a minute, are you treating me like a, I'm a kindergartner? I mean, I'm a smart kid, I'm a UCLA, so why should I do that? And that creates really a, a drop of empathy, really, even empathy for the concept you're trying to learn, and that's an obstacle, and that's not going to help you. Hmm. Hmm, that's very interesting. W would you would you say that by by consciously mirroring, like say if I, I was in a situation where I needed someone to help me or to generate empathy from another person, by by consciously mirroring them, would I elicit an empathy response? As long as you do it in a very subtle way, yes. Uh, I mean, when it comes to very young subjects, you don't have to, to do it in a very subtle way. You can do an experiment. You can go to a, if you go next time you're at a party and there are very young kids, you know, maybe in the first or the second year of your life, you imitate what they do and they love it. Uh, but if you are interacting with a, with a, with a grown-up, what you want to do is to really try to um, really be attuned to what they do. And that's why actually what we tend to do whenever people explain things to us, we nod a little. It's not we really have to nod to understand what they're saying, but by nodding, we tell them with our own body that we're really, under, I mean, listening to what they're saying and understanding what they're saying. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the way you want to do and by doing that, the interesting thing is that this creates a, a virtuous circle. I mean, if you're really attuned to someone else, then that person really gets drawn to you too. 
And then there is this really nice bonding between people. It's one of those things that it's also very easy to break down. I mean, if you become distracted and you're looking somewhere else or you're uh, really thinking of something else, that person that is interacting with you perceives that immediately. And so this very nice connection can really be broken very quickly. So that's why, I, I mean, I don't want to convey the, the message that really is something that you requires a lot of effort to do this. Uh, again, maybe because I tend to be a very empathic guy, it to me comes very natural. But I would say that it shouldn't really take you long to really get to attune to others and then to get people drawn to you too so that there is this very nice bonding between people. Yeah, it seems like these cells play a huge role in in intelligence, not only intelligence, but emotional intelligence and the the idea that we can fit into social groups by, you know, being able to imitate what what these people are doing and, and also by looking at the people that we respect as people who hold social value and imitating what they're doing. So it's very interesting everything that, that you guys are doing over there at, at your lab. What I mean, have you have you guys gotten into any of the theoretical usage usages of of these these mirror neurons yet? Uh, what do you mean with theoretical? I mean, well, why I mean, rise a lot, but <laughs> like, um, what do you mean? like the usage of uh, a program to kind of simulate, like in in a computer, like artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually recently saw Ex Machina, which I think is the best movie in artificial intelligence ever made. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that if you talk to people that build robots, like Maya Mataric, she's a professor at USC. I talked to her and she told me, you know, before you guys discovered me yourselves, while I was building my robots, I was thinking... Exactly that. I would need something that mirrors what in my robot, the mirrors what other people are doing. Um, and so, yeah, there is a lot of both computational neuroscience and robotics and artificial intelligence that is trying to capitalize on this uh, uh, phenomenon. It turns out that mirroring is probably even a more widespread phenomenon. There is a recent paper that just came out this week that shows that if you look at the activity, in the brain, uh, in the motor cortex, and you look at what happens in the motor um, fibers in your muscles, there is a lot of similarities between the neurons that fire in your brain and the activity that your um, fibers in your muscles, in your body parts, are doing. Um, so mirroring seems to be really a, a, a something that nature exploits a lot. And I would say that if you want to build artificial entities that are efficient as humans are, you should probably try to exploit the mirroring too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems like the direction to go. I mean, we're, we're running out of time here, Marco, but is there is there anything that you have discovered recently or anything that you would like to share with our audience? Um, and this, is, this would be the moment to do it. Oh, okay. You put me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, the thing we're doing now is really to, as I told you earlier, to figure out how to control it. Uh, because, I mean, you need to assume that if you have this thing that, you know, whenever I see you doing something, I tend to do it too. It turns out we don't do that, right? We don't imitate each other all the time. Otherwise, that would be extremely dysfunctional. And yet, we don't have to make even an effort to do that. So, what we're trying to do is to figure out what is the interaction between mirroring, which we call the bottom-up process. That is, I see your face smiling and I can't help it. Inside me, my mirror self for smiling, no, fire up. And also my top-down process, that's how do I control it. I mean, I'm not, it's not like whenever you smile, I smile myself. Um, that's, I think, we think that that's really the key to figure out how this interaction creates a very um, efficient, and fluent social life. The other thing I want to say is that uh, I've been recently thinking a lot about how this mirroring phenomenon and its control can actually go wrong. And what do I mean with that? I mean with that that it, there are situations in which we tend to rely so much on, on either our beliefs or on our practices that then they interact with the environment in a sort of bad way and they can create some really uh, negative behaviors. And I want to end this 
by saying that uh, one, the more I think about the brain, the more I think that it's really evolution has devised the brain to make it uh, a device that really detects action that can be afforded by the environment. And so you want to have an environment that really does not afford bad actions. Um, and that really gets into even the level of policy. Can you actually use neuroscience to figure out how to organize society? Uh, I don't want to say anything more specific than this because it's uh, a developing way of thinking. I mean, actually, that would maybe the the topic of my next book um, after re- after writing Mirroring People, there was I loved that book so much that for many years I couldn't write anything else because I had to fall in love with another story. And I think I'm slowly falling in love with this idea that if you look at a, how the brain works, it's really a device that detects potential actions, and so you want to create an environment that will prevent some kinds of actions and will facilitate some other kinds of actions. Let me put it that way. I really like what you said about falling in love with the idea. Um, Marco, I really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for that. Where can people find your work? I think this is very important to create awareness on this topic. Where can people find your work, buy your book? Um, I think Amazon has it. Um, you can certainly download it from online, from various Kindle or uh, um, iBooks. Um, I'm not too happy about, you know, publishing, the publishing industry in general. But I think that, you know, at Amazon you can find it. Uh, I don't think it's heavily distributed, but it's been what's called a long seller. I mean, a number of people keep buying it. Um, uh, and I think it's it's a fun book. It's called Mirroring People. And I actually try to write it in a way that uh, it's not just about the science and the concept, but also explains that science, even though we tend to think about it as a kind of, you know, this almost... Uh, in personal activity, it's made by people, people that have feelings and emotions and beliefs. And so I try to talk about that too. And I build sort of a narrative from really the basic science to the implication for our society. Um, a lot of people that read the book say it's one of the greatest read that they yet. Uh, and so, of course, I have conflict of interest, but I still love that book so much. That's why I haven't written another book. People keep asking me, when, when do you write another book? Well, whenever I fall in love with another story. <laughs> That's great, man. Um, do you do you have a website though? Yeah, I mean, my my website is uh, you actually if you just Google Jacoboni Lab, you'll find it. But I'll give you the the correct address. We can make uh, that link available in the post oh, when great. we post this. Yeah. But um, otherwise, Marco, it's it's been great having you here. This is the human experience. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will be back next week.